Hello and welcome to Mendlin Loves Youth, a broadcast and a conversation in commemoration of the sacrifices of the generation of 1976 and celebration of a future that a new generation must take hold of. I'm Sizo Mpofu Walsh. I'll be moderating this discussion with some of South Africa's brightest young people from a variety of backgrounds. We are broadcasting live from Mendlin Park Shopping Center. We'd also like to thank Starbucks in this center for hosting us. And can't wait to get stuck into a fascinating conversation as we throw forward to Youth Day. Before we do that, I'd like to introduce you and welcome Olive Ndebele, who is the general manager of Mendlin Park Shopping Center. We'll give a brief welcome and introduction, and then we'll get stuck in to a fascinating discussion on the nature of Youth Day and the state of youth in our country. Ms. Ndebele, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, and welcome to Mainland. I'd just like to also acknowledge today as uh, International Blood Donation Day. So to those of you that do donate blood, thank you for the gift of life that we give to others. The youth of today are the leaders of tomorrow, said Nelson Mandela. And I'm sure we've heard all sorts of people talking about the youth. As a business, as Midland Park Shopping Center, we thought, well, talk is cheap, right? We talk about these things, we talk about supporting the youth, we talk about listening to them, listening to their aspirations, et cetera, but do we actually give them a platform to express themselves? And in that platform of expressing themselves, what do we then as the older generation, yeah, acknowledging the generational gaps that we have as well, what is it that we do to implement their dreams and their aspirations, and to also understand, you know, and appreciate the different backgrounds that we have, the different beliefs that we have, the different perspectives, because we were brought up differently. I'm a mother of three, so I can kind of relate to the strangers in the house, and they also think that I'm a stranger in the house. <laughs> so with that being, we're very proud and we're very honored to be able to have this platform of engagement. And um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the panelists because we could not do this without you as well as yourself. You know, um, you were chosen because you are leaders, you are role models, you are entrepreneurs, you are people that choose to stay in the townships when we are all urbanizing because that is the hip thing to do and that is a sign of success. But in the Africa Rising story, um, we also say we need to self-love, and hence the men that loves the youth. People have made sacrifices for us to be able to sit on a round table today and drink Starbucks coffee and, um, and speak a universal language. Do you know, um, it, but what are we doing then to emancipate ourselves further? So as entrepreneurs, as people that know the hustle and the grind, and as people that represent students and understand the youth, and understand um, the mental fitness and the mental challenges mm -hmm. and, um, and, and just the grind, you know, and a person that has launched their own brands and understanding the competitive environment, you are role models. And that is why you are around here at this table to also motivate us and our youth and so that we can strengthen ourselves going forward. So looking forward to the debate, and thank you to everybody that's here. Well, thank you so much for providing the platform. Can't wait to get stuck in, and just to let you know, hi to everyone that we're streaming to, by the way, on YouTube, on Facebook, shout out to you. Thank you to our audience, who will also be participating a bit later. But I'd like to get to the main event now and ask our, our guests um, to introduce themselves to us, and we'll get the conversation going. There'll also be some coffee coming soon, people, so don't worry. Like, it's on the way. We're, we're at a Starbucks, so we have to. Yeah. So to my right, we've got Lebuhang Mokubela, who is uh, a trailblazer in business and founder of the Lemok Group of Companies. We've also got Mokhao Seshweni, who is founder of the Lazy Magodi, doing incredible things in the food and business space. We've then also got Lise Njohu. Thank you so much for joining us, Lise, who is the founder and CEO of Freckle Village. She's in the eyewear game. Uh, maybe I need to come through and like, get a new... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Lise. We've got David uh, Kabwa, who is the... Wait, most importantly, was one of my students. So I'm glad to see my students thriving. 
Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us, David. Uh, and who's the president of the SRC at the University of Pretoria. And then finally, we're joined by two further guests. We've got Mohadi Mabela, who is doing incredible work at the intersection of farming and business with raw honey, um, handling her beeness. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Tepo Mosala, known as the jeans guy, incredible entrepreneur in the clothing and textile space, working on incredible denim products and just trailblazing. Thank you so much all for joining us. It's wonderful to be here with you. And I'd like to start with, oh, and the coffee arrives just at the, at the opportune time. moment. We didn't, we didn't plan that, but okay. How much do you like coffee uh, now? Just <laughs> <laughs> um, let me start with you. You're the founder of a group of companies. You've taken an interesting struggle into the township economy and building from the ground up there. My question to you, and it'll be my question to all of you, is before we get to moving to solutions and the great solutions that you've all applied in your lives, what do you think is the mission of this particular generation? I believe um, one of the things that we need to be doing is unpacking or rather continuing a new narrative, um, creating a new narrative and spearheading this narrative. Like particularly what we've done is in my industry in marketing, predominantly a person would start an agency, the first thing they would do is move to a Roseback or Santon because that's the hub of where things mm. are. And, and who said that? Because you open the office in the Santon area, but you're going to market to the people that live in the townships. So who said you can't open an agency in a township? Mm. No one said that. And I think it's spearheading those conversations and having a new narrative to say, let's debunk what success really looks like. Mm. What is the new narrative about success, particularly in business, and not superficial stuff. So my, 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 my two cents on what the mission of this generation is, it's finding a new narrative and, and spearheading mm. that. Uh, that's really fascinating. Mohao, um, Le Bohang's kicked us off in finding our new narrative. What do you think the mission of this generation is? Um, I think that the new mission of this generation um, coupled with, of course, dealing with the poverty situation in our country and unemployment, um, for me, is going back to who we are, particularly as Africans. I think it's, um, you know, embracing who we are, what it truly means to be African. Um, I think the movie... Um, the Black Panther proved more than ever. Yeah. We're the generation that's refusing to relax our hair because we love our hair just as it goes out of our heads. So we are that generation that's truly embracing who we are, writing our own rules. Absolutely. And I'm just going to let the conversation flow around so I yeah. don't dominate too much. Okay. I think from my side, um, the youth is all about um, finding their identity and um, understanding that we are living in the technology era, we see um, the youth finding their own um, identity and coming up with um, new concepts and um, not using the traditional ways of doing business, not using the, the old ways of, um, of acquiring skills. So I think for us, for me, that's, uh, that's one thing that comes out to say it's about the identity. They just want to find out who they are. They are not going to conform to the norm. Yeah, that's Absolutely. good. And I think um, if I could, sorry. Oh, sorry, so sorry. <laughs> this is a youth-led conversation. Um, it's a youth-led yeah. conversation. So with me, like what I've, what I've discovered over the past um, couple of days is that, um, for instance, we are driven mainly by three things, passion, purpose, and, and, and resilience. You know, um, lots of, most of us want to create companies, brands. We want to create a legacy. Um, as a black boy coming from Kotsakane, I have never been given a patent, I've never been passed on something. So I need to restart my family tree. I need to create something that I can pass on to my kids if I have kids in the next couple of years or so, um, or to my family. But we are like, I think Botaki from my era, we are really obsessed with creating legacies. Um, I was having a chat with a friend of mine yesterday and she was saying, which, you know, it's slowly but surely it's fading out for Ribotaki when they start making money. They spend it on big cars. They spend it on, you know, and now we're about saving. 
We're all about thinking about the next generation. If I want to reach the billion dollar mark like Jay-Z, I need to start making smart moves. You know, not spending my money in the club, not spending my money on big cars that you know, can be written off. So I need to start making um, mature moves, sure. cal calculated moves. And that's what I feel like the youth of today is much more obsessed with. For sure. David, as a student representative, your views on the mission of this generation right now? Right. So what really is enshrined in our generation is agency, the ability to act. Because oftentimes, as young people, we're invited to very many spaces. And in those spaces, we are able to participate. And the question then becomes, does my participation bring about an action? Yeah. Do I have the ability to make a clear, concise, as well as an evident action through everything it is that I'm doing? It is why on Instagram we spend so much time trying to look successful. It is why on our social media we will spend so many hours trying to get that perfect picture and post it so that we can give off that impression that, you know what, this is somebody who is doing something. I would say the mission of this particular generation is to actually have the agency that so many of us have been chasing after for so many years. And let's end off this round as we open out this discussion and defining this mission um, with your views. Mahadi, please. Um, with my, my, my observation is that, you know, we've been given an opportunity to start on a blank canvas. Um, what I've appreciated about living in today is the fact that you can start doing anything and pursue it and passionately, passionately follow it and you can gain a following and appreciation for that without it necessarily being a traditional company or a traditional stream, you know, whatever it is that you find your niche, you find your space, do it, follow it, and everything else follows you. Um, I, I know with, with, with myself and the industry that I'm in, I don't fit in in any way. You know, um, all, all, all the images of the industry I'm in um, don't have a person like me. And um, for the longest time, you know, I've wanted to do it, um, and I had every reason not to. And the moment I did, uh, and the moment I was genuine about what I was doing and where I was coming from and why I was doing it, um, people appreciated what I did and it started to look attractive and people wanted to be in the space that I'm in simply because I made the decision to actually pursue something, start it and passionately follow it. So the, 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 the one thing that I appreciate about being a child or a youth today is the fact that you can start anyway with anything that you love and just put whatever you have into it, pursue it and, 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 and everything else else follows. And this is not to say it's easy, but it's to say that if you do something and you start somewhere, because the, 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 the view is that you need to have a lot of money, the view is that you need to have a lot of resources, you need to have rich parents, you must come from a good family for you to be able to start something successful. And, and the youth of today are changing that narrative. You know, um, everybody who's sitting here on this table started with nothing. Um, and, and they are where they are today because they just found their niche and pursued it and, and ended up where they are today. Absolutely. I think it's wonderful that you've ended on the question of starting a new narrative that we began on. And I'd like to now start just a conversation so, you know, don't worry, it's not too rigid. Feel free to come in where you like. But we've identified the mission and its multifaceted dimensions. I think it's really cool to just give our viewers a little bit of inspiration now and speak about how each of you has, in your own lives and in your own projects, executed on changing something about your surroundings. And can you just share with us how you've identified that mission, but actually tried to make a contribution to the solution as well? And the floor is open, so just feel free to jump in and, and have a, a conversation on that. So, Mokhau, oh, okay. I so, saw Mokhau uh, smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I saw yeah, no, let's, let's, let's do so it. Sorry, Mokhau, no, it's okay. You know, I love you so much. You know, it's like, okay. okay. <laughs> um, with me, like, what had I think from a very young age, I'm always, I was raised by, by my grandparents, and my Kriza is a pastor. And in our family, we, are a, we serve the community. And for me, growing up, I wanted to serve the community 
in a different form. And in 2015, I realized that I can serve the community by making jeans. And for me, by making the best pair of jeans in the world, it has allowed me to serve the community by employing people. You know, yesterday I was talking about how one pair of jeans that we make is it's, it's a collaborative effort. It takes 56 people to make one pair of jeans. And it's from the guy who plants the cotton to the guy who weaves the fabric to the guy who actually makes the jeans and to you who buys it. So for me, it's, it's, it's always been about serving the community and also creating something that has a lasting effect that can open up the, the community so much that um, I can employ 2,000, 10,000 people. Um, but me, it's, it's like literally serving. And that's what I, I love doing best. And everything else follows. You know, all the money, the fame, and everything. Once you stick to your purpose, everything follows. And that's sure. what I've learned with myself. It took me a long time to get to where I am. But by believing myself, being resilient, being passionate, loving, and always changing my strategy all the time. I'm small, I'm a small company, and um, we have the ability to change our strategy now and again. You know, sure. if it doesn't work, we can implement something new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. thanks for kicking us off, Tebu. We appreciate it. And Mokhal, the floor is yours. And, and feel free to jump in whenever you, you're ready for the others. So I'll tell my little story. Um, so I remember discovering this, this list. It's called the UN's list of intangible aspects of humanity in need of urgent safeguarding. Very long. Oh, wow. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, this is a list of, um, you know, art, music, food, literature from all over the world, all sorts of different cultures. And the only cuisine on this list was Italian, French, and Japanese. So that means the whole world endeavors to preserve these foods that are considered essential for human heritage. And I wondered why isn't our food on here? Not even jollof rice from Nigeria, mm. come on. Mm. So yeah, and that's sort of how my business started and I started giving lessons on traditional South African food. So none of the pastas, none of the American burgers. If you're in South Africa and your mom, your grandma didn't teach you how to cook these things, where are you going to go to learn? And then that then led to uh, myself, me publishing a cookbook last year. And I remember the process of publishing this book and everybody said, um, this book is not going to sell. Mm. South Africans want, you know, a more Western, more worldly, you know, perspective on food. And then we went on to break every single record when it comes to cookbooks, nominated for two international awards, just proving that South Africans were ready, were hungry to be reflected in everything. Mm. And that includes cookbooks. Mm. I want to open a cookbook and see myself, my grandma, my family reflected in that book, just like I with yeah. movies and everything else. So you were brave with going against the stereotypes. It was hard. It was yeah. hard and it <laughs> made a success story. Mm. Well done. Yeah. So I guess I, I echo everyone's um, you know, sentiments about believing in something and yeah. really seeing it through. Mm. It yeah. really did pay off for me. Yeah. The best selling cookbook in the country right now and it's been oh. so since it came out in mm. October. Yeah. So I mean young people are often not given a platform, so just this inspiration I feel is in such short yeah. supply and it's great to hear these these yeah. stories, the first two already. Any, any other interventions just yeah. about how you have, you know, taken the bull by the horns, as it were, and done your thing? I think from our well, side, well. Um, sure, we'll come to you. <laughs> what we did is was to find the, to identify the need and then also find the niche within that. I think um, the main reason why um, I went into retail was the was that uh, I was bold enough to take on the big giants because I remember <laughs> when we started, they gave us one month saying you're gonna close down and mm. then m one month passed and they gave us three months and then we sustained the, We stayed in the industry up until they realized that we are here to make a business because uh, they were saying uh, to us, as we all know that um, cash flow is an issue. I mean, also experience is an issue, but we, you know, what we identified within ourselves was that we have the passion to do this. And um, if you've got the passion to do this uh, and you believe in yourself and um, you, you, you believe in your faith more than you believe in your fears, that what will propel you to, to go forward. And also, again, we were passionate about empowering. I love to transfer skills. As a matter of fact, in my company, I only employ the youth. 
and uh, it, even the promotions, promotions comes from within, and it's it's a company policy to say not unless it's a it's a it's a specialized need, uh, and the position needs somebody with. Um, maybe higher qualification and experience. But what we yeah. do, we try as much as, po as possible to empower our own staff. And I always tell them that, you know what, if you, I'll be sad if you leave my company just because I did not empower you. But if you leave for greener pastures, I'm more than happy to release you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with me, um, so Fresh out of high school, my first year, I actually started my first business. It was an events business. Wow, you didn't waste any time. Eh? No, I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, this business closed down two years later, around 2011, mainly because I didn't have business acumen. So make profit, and then I'm somewhere shy for swiping, mm -hmm. and money's mm -hmm. gone the next thing. You start from scratch again. <laughs> so the business closed down. So anyway, I started work. I got a job at an agency that I met through um, the events that I was doing. And I landed a job there, and I worked in the market as a marketing agency. And within 18 months, I was then promoted to director of operations. And then one thing that led me to quitting there, which was a very good job, uh, my grandmother actually was angry at me for quite a number of months for quitting the job. But what angered me was the fact that when we were doing campaigns that spoke to township people, it was like it was a templated thing. Give them free t-shirts, stress balls, and lanyards. Make them dance. And that is marketing. If they dance for it and they, they have a big hoo-ha, they will then go and buy your brand. And I'm like, but I am the target market because I am from the township. And number one, making me dance and giving me a stress ball will not make me buy your brand. And that's when I quit. I was like, you know what? I'm going back home. And I'm going to be in charge of this narrative that is township. And in the beginning, like I said, you, most people are like, you have to be in a Rose Bank or Center to make it. Clients won't take you serious. Your address on your invoice is 725 Block N, not William Nicole. It's 725 Block L. People won't take you serious. But I took it boldly, and I even started calling myself a township entrepreneur. And today we do business with JSE listed companies. And that's where the trend is. The people that are in Center are moving, opening malls, shops in the townships and the township people are leaving going to the center so who's in charge of what's happening in the townships mm. and so for me that was it's something that has always been a passion of mine even now my my wife is investing in, in a franchise i've been fighting the franchise all to actually open it in the township but because of the nsa target market the township is not seen as what is a township but that's how mm. for me i've been passionate about the township market because that the buying power in the township is over 4 billion rand. It circulates there, but the problem is where does it go? Okay. That's the problem. So that's, yeah. So, and there'll be an opportunity for you to share the rest of your stories and, and also people watching, just make sure you Google everyone on our panel because I was literally blown away by just the ingenuity and the creativity. It's inspiring to hear how you have all done these incredible things as young South Africans living in this moment. But I also want to speak a little bit about the broader social problems that affect our country and the way that young people are often marginalized, silenced, and left out of what's happening in our country, left out of the decision-making tables. We're doing great things individually. Isn't it time we also started doing something together as a generation? I'm throwing that out to you and, and saying, how do we, how do we shift the whole narrative and recenter our generation, which is being so marginalized? I really like that, uh, that question. And the reason why I like it is because of what you said in your opening statements. And you said we are multifaceted. And I think that is one of the most beautiful things about us as youth, about us as young people. The fact that we are so multifaceted, I think. First of all, it's understanding that we will never ever get to a point where we all agree on a common vision. I'll love it, you'll hate it, she'll support it, he will just tweet how bad it is. Black Twitter is a real thing. Right. Go easy on us, people. So, in moving forward, I really believe it is key to realize that that sort of support mechanism, I think that is a brilliant way to start. Because when you realize that I got to get there, that is my goal, that is where it is that I want to end up. The person next to you says, I like that ambition, 
but I want to go that way. The thing that we have in common is that we all want to move forward. Now, as young people, we're very competitive. And because of that, it's very easy for me to get on my phone and start blasting you when I don't like what you're doing simply because I don't agree with you or I want what it is that you have. But when we can find that common ground, I think that is the first step in the right direction towards moving forward as this particular generation. Yes, I'm putting I'm pressure on you. Yeah, I'm, yeah, finding yeah. A very, I'm, I'm finding the conversation very interesting and very inspiring. Mm. And all the stories, you know, the one common thread that I'm finding is that there was a lot of self-belief. So, you know, with that, I'm also asking you as a youth, what are you saying, what would you say, what would you advise to the other youth that is out there that's got the pressures of social media? Because I'm made to believe that social media is possibly one of the greatest form, causes of depression because people just believe, ah, oh, you know, you can live large, look at that person living large, I want to be like them, but you are at zero. So how do you actually get the courage to bridge that gap to go from zero to something? Because a lot of the dialogue that we are hearing informally, you know, from the youth is that they, they feel like they're stuck. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to get there. And um, I don't know if there is enough mentors and co coaches that are you, the youth that understand them. Because us as the older generation, I think we have a language barrier. I mean, if I just look at the language that's being used on, you know, the person is going to DM me. I'm like, what's a DM? Oh, it's a direct <laughs> message. So why don't you just say direct message? So there is so many gaps in just even yeah. us understanding each other. But as the youth, how do you then support each other to say there is a real life other than the glamour? Mm -hmm. And you can reach the glamour, but you have to put in time and effort. That's what our generation would say. So what do you say to each other and what are you saying to the youth out there? I think from my side, I would say it start by understanding that social media is a communication tool, right? And if you understand that, it comes with the rules and regulations. And um, also, you find them that they are the citizens of the social media. But before you become a social media citizen, you are a human being. And um, so if you understand that in real life, there are pressing issues that needs to be addressed as a youth, then you can use the social media to address those issues. And also, again, they, we all understand that there are social, pre social media pressures, but it's all about believing in yourself. It's all about um, asking those difficult questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? You know, because you find that the pressures comes from them comparing themselves with others. But if you understand that you are unique, you are on this earth for your own unique purpose, then you will use the social media as a tool, but use it more effectively. I think um, from my side, um, I've, your question was people want to actually be glamorous or rather what you posed is that, you know, the youth wants to see glamour, they want to, you know, see a life that they can aspire to. And the glamour is your story, you know? Um, I think the common thing with all of us here is that we've put our stories out for the world to see. And people... It's, it's all good and well to be in fancy cars and, and, and expensive houses, and there's nothing wrong with that. And drink expensive things. And drink expensive champagne, <laughs> you know? There's nothing wrong with that. But what, what I've picked up is that um, the people of today are attracted to genuineness. They're attracted to people's stories. They're attracted to the build-up. They're attracted to the journey. So it doesn't mean if you don't have a glamorous house, if you don't have a glamorous car, um, then, you know, you won't be attractive. You'd be surprised um, at, 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 you know, every time when we measure our, um, our, our, our social uh, media presence and the hits that we get from the different uh, kind of, you know, information we feed out from, from what we do, the ones which get the most hits are the genuine stories. Absolutely. So when I post my product, people like it, it's okay, you know. Um, but when you post a story of what you're actually doing and why you're doing what you're doing, that's when people are actually, you know, attracted to what you do, and that's why they admire what you do. By the time you get a house, 
they've been with you from the onset and they feel like they're part of you know your story of what you do so the glamour doesn't necessarily have to be in the end goal the glamour can be in your journey you know um, if you are genuine and if you are putting out the real everyday stories of, of you know what you go through and that does that that seems to be attractive it doesn't necessarily have to be you know the the, the, the end goal mm. um, I think I think from my side just to add on to what you were saying it's I I I saw social media as one of the most beautiful inventions in the world. Um, my brand was born simply from social media on Instagram. I changed my handle to just tap or to tap the gene maker, which a couple of months later, um, I created a real brand out of it. And today, like the people who first followed me when I started, they can literally trace where I've been. And what I've realized is we, like you're saying, we are, we, 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 a lot of people want to follow real stories. A lot of people are attracted to real stories. And I feel like a lot of young people who fall under depression are the ones who haven't really discovered their purpose. You know, um, when you think success is based on the car you drive, the brand you wear, the girl you're dating, the spaces you, you play around in, it's those type of people who kind of find themselves in a very depressing spaces because they haven't really discovered who they are. And unfortunately, social media kind of fuels it up. You know, the ones who get the most hits are the ones with the nicest things, you know, as opposed to a guy who's making jeans, a uh, Victoria uh, <laughs> um, and, and and but like for me, I feel like we're living in such a beautiful time, such a, a great era in our lives that we are in a global platform. Our narrative is no longer African, but our narrative is world. You know, um, I have clients from across the world because of social media, because they send me on internet, on, on Explorer, in, on Twitter, wherever. And it's, it's, I use social media as a platform to drive my messaging. I use social media to touch a person. When I first started out, I only wanted to sell jeans and I always, always wanted to create memories. You know, and for me, it's seeing people wearing the stuff, posting it, being proud about it. Yeah. It's the most fulfilling moment ever. You know, one of my mentors said to me, Tepo, success is the best selling book is when you've touched one person and that's enough. And that's what we do is like, so, I just want to touch one person with my story and that's it. So, you know, I think you've touched beautifully on the way that social media can be a force for positivity, can be a force for change. Sometimes I wonder whether we've been denied an opportunity that previous generations had because it's really difficult to reinvent yourself when you've got this like history of who you once were on social media. You know? I feel like an older generation could be like, ah, oh, forget that old me, I'm a new person today. And there was no record of that old yeah. person. And now you're kind of shackled to the person you created like 10 years ago, you know, and there's that record. Do, you, do any of you feel some of the negative aspects of the pressure that social media creates? Um, I think I'm going to echo what he said. Um, social media can be a curse or a gift, depending on how you use it. And just like Tepo, um, I've met amazing people sim only through social media, because they found me on Twitter or mm. on Instagram. People who I've gone on to collaborate with, people who have gone on to mentor or be mentored by them, because of social media, I, I credit 100% the growth of my business very early on mm. to social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if I can just add on sure. to that <coughs> point, um, you know, I was speaking to a group of kids the other day, and I was like, hands up, who here has heard of MXRT? Mix it. And everyone's looking at me, and they're like, what? What are you, what are you saying? I'm like, all right, BBM? They're like, no, no. I'm like, all right, uh, have you at least heard of WhatsApp? And they yeah. said, yeah, yeah, you know, we know what that is. And um, the thing that I noticed was with all of them, they didn't really view it as the past. They did not view it as reinventing myself, but rather a form of growth. And the reason why I say that is because even myself, when I go back and I trace my social media posts all the way back, mm. I can see how far I've come. And I'll oftentimes do that. People that I look up to, I'll get on their pages. And it's, it's what you said about the beautiful, the inspirational story. 
Um, we really have the capacity to do that via our social media. Um, but then also just to touch on the point that was made specifically about identity. Oftentimes we'll get on social media, we don't really know who we are or what it is that we want to say. And you'll notice how, back to the point about being genuine, when you find your identity, kind of your niche, that's where you start to grow. And whether or not it is difficult for us in this generation, I would say once you find your identity, you can say no matter what you say, I cannot be defeated, denied, or disgraced because I am who I am, and that is beautiful. Well, that is beautiful. And we also have a beautiful audience with us today, and we've, we've been rather neglectful of them. <laughs> we've been having such a, a lit conversation here. So I'd like to bring in some members of our audience now who have been listening to the conversation. See if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the members of our panel, make any interventions into the discussion, and then we'll throw back into the panel to react to some of your thoughts. But if, if you could you know, just offer some thoughts and some interventions, we'd appreciate that. Use the mic. Use the mic, the mic uh, if you could just make sure you speak into the mic. Kamkhelo. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I felt like the owner of businesses, right? When one starts with an idea, how do how people, how people like that idea into something real? Sure. How do you do Taking it from idea into reality. Yeah. Thanks so much. Any further questions? Thanks so much, Kamokhelo, for kicking us off. Shout out to you for that. Um, hi, I'm Noma. Um, hey, Noma. My question is just, I've heard a lot. I, I'm enjoying the conversation, by the way. So glad. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hearing a lot. Um, about saying, you guys are saying, young people must have their passion drive them. They must have that be the foundation and then every, like passion will always drive them. But I'm not sure whether by saying that we are downplaying the socioeconomic issues that, down, that affect young people. I'm not sure whether we're giving enough attention. I'm not sure whether we're saying, we're actually noting that there are so many problems where passion literally just, sometimes it's not doing enough on its own. Thanks so much, Noma. Do we have maybe one more thought or question? Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Kukit. So I'd like, I'd like to add on to the social media part where we have just touched on. So what I understand about social media, uh, when someone becomes depressed because he feels pressure from social media, I feel like as an individual, before you even tackle the part of social media, you should know, firstly know who you are. And when we are impressed by something on social media, don't try to say, I want to get there. There's something that you, as an individual you should do. You should try to ask information. Like I could be okay, so sitting here owning a business, right? And I have a friend that's come here, and he also wants to run a business, right? And whenever he sees me slaying at Dubai, he doesn't come here and ask me, okay, so how did you make your business more successful? He just chooses to go and sell his own jeans and say, hopes that he's going to make it end. But if she could make one move to say, okay, so how did you make your T-shirt? more popular, make it as a brand so that more people know about it. I think later in the stage, his jeans or her, or her jeans are going to go broad, just like my jeans. So I feel like as youth, we should ask information rather than assuming that you're going to make ends meet. Because if ends don't meet, you're going to be depressed. If you don't get a job, you're going to be depressed. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Koket. So any other questions from the audience? Oh, great. We've got one final question from the audience, and we'll Hi, throw back to the I'm panel. I'm Sinhue. Uh, I have two Sinhue. questions for the panel. My first one is, um, you guys are all entrepreneurs, and I'd like to know what were some of your lows of lows? Because we always see the Instagram pictures. We always see someone buying a jean or someone buying a cookbook. But we don't really know the behind the stories of your girl before I got to even publishing that. How did you get there? And the second question is, um, as, as a panel, what would you say is some of the issue um, that is plaguing the, the youth of today? You know, what, what are we facing that is really stopping us and hindering us from achieving our goals? Because you're sitting here and someone else is like, oh, I'd love to be you, but they don't really know how to get there. So what are some of those issues that you think we are facing? Thanks so much. Was it Sivewe yeah. or Simpiwe? Simpiwe. Simpiwe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Some wonderful questions from our audience. I think you guys should have been on the panel as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to once say... again throw it open and, and respond to those wonderful questions and, and prov provocations. Can yeah, I just so take... I'll... Oh, sorry. Oh, sure. sorry. We'll, we'll so, come to um, you. Said. I, I, I've come full circle, right? So my background is that my father is a beekeeper, like he still is today. He oh. makes honey for a living, right? Okay. And... Um, 
we don't have any like boys at home. So you'd know that, you know, in African culture, like the fathers have no time for, you know, teaching the daughters, you know, that trade so that they can continue the legacy. And I wanted to do it, you know, when I left high school, I wanted to actually go in farming, but the stereotypes were all just against me. You know, like I, I was black, I was a girl, you know, I was young. You look at a, a, a bee farmer in today, like he's an old white male. Like, you know, I, I didn't fit in anywhere and I was so intimidated by the idea. But then I was always selling my father's honey, you know, so that he can, you know, people liked it because it was, it was such a good product. Mm. Um, and it was a good product or it is a good product because it's, it's, it's South African. It's 100% raw South African pure honey. And because I was always uh, selling his honey, I started, people loved it so much. They wanted more of the honey. So I started getting more honey from my father, right? And then... Um, when I started demanding so much honey from him, he's like, look, I don't work for you. Like, get your own beehive. Mm. I'll teach you how to actually, you know, manage that beehive to make your own honey. And um, that's how I actually started in, in, in Native Nosy. And, you know, I've just, I've just learned that I, I, I should have started um, not taking away from everything that I've learned between the time I was intimidated of starting to when I actually did start. But it taught me that, you know what, I, I, I should have just executed this idea when I initially wanted to. Because now I, I have to do a lot of unraveling, uh, like corporate world, family, everything. And then there's just so many responsibilities now, you know, and it's more difficult to just, you know, make certain decisions. Um, because now there's so many responsibilities, whereas if I had started when, 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 when I wanted to initially, and I wasn't so overwhelmed by how I didn't fit in. Um, and I was just more focused on, you know, what, what is it that I can start with? I wasn't a beekeeper, but I was always selling honey. You know, I, I got honey, I sold honey, and, and, and that's how I started. So I think I've, I've, I've just learned that, you know what, um, what you are, what you are, the aim is not to, to fit in, mm. it's to stand out. You know, you, you want to do what you want to do. Mm. And uh, people follow that, you know, and, and that's what I've learned that I should have actually just started it from the onset mm. because people appreciate what I do now so much that I feel like I've lost out on so much. But it just talks to what the gentleman was asking that how do you execute, you know, your, 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 your plan into an actual business? Just, just start. Mm. Mm. Can I just also answer the two, two questions that, um, that they ask about... Uh, from um, identifying the, the need, how then do you action the, the, and get started in a business? Mm. I'll just give you a typical story. Um, I left corporate in 2014, and then uh, I, had a, I had that, uh, that, that desire to, to start my own business. And uh, how I made it is, uh, I remember every weekend, I would invite my, my ex-business partner and say, let's sit, let's brainstorm. What do you want to do? We'll go all crazy. We'll have a table, we'll have pen and paper, we'll scratch, we'll write down. And that was the ritual every weekend. And up until we came to have a business plan. From the business plan, now that we knew what we wanted to do, then we, we registered the company. And because uh, what my, 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 my aim was to say, the only thing that is lacking from us right now is the funding. We've got the idea, we've got the passion. We will find, the investor must find us ready. So what I'm trying to say is that you might have an idea of wanting to start your business. Always go back and visit that, uh, that, that business. We know that in life you grow every day. You find that, go and refine that idea that you wrote down yesterday. And also, go ahead uh, that which you have learned. So what I'm trying to say is that don't leave it out there hanging, you know. And also equip yourself. I mean, on the internet, information is freely available. There are videos, there are information search. Go there and augment your business, you know, up until you are ready to present it. You'll find that the funder is already waiting, but they want um, a fundable business. And then the second one was the the lows of the business. Yeah, that's what I was hoping to hear because like <laughs> we can all pretend like it, it was just yeah. a walk in the yes, park, but those yeah. lows are real, right? Yeah, I, I remember just to, just to narrate a, um, a story uh, <laughs> in mm. my second year of business. Um, to be quite honest, we started on the good footing. 
we were making the numbers and uh, come the second year, I remember I was traveling, on a, I was going on a business trip and it was towards month and the bills were piling up mm. and, uh, and there was no money in the bank. I remember take, phoning my mentor and I said, we've got a crisis here, mm. so how am I going to manage this? And I'm getting out of the country, uh, debits are going to bounce, what's going to happen? And um, I remember his one word was, uh, Lisa, welcome to business. Now mm. you've started to, to do business. Sure. And you've touched on where such an important... He said to me, you're now learning to be in business, where you mm. learn to manage nothing, something sure. with nothing. You mm. know, th sure. those words, I got on a plane, they were playing, they were so loud. And I said, yeah. managing nothing with, managing something with nothing, what does it mean? He hasn't given me a clue. I thought maybe he was going to say to me, okay, go apply for an overdraft. Mm. He said, I'll never teach you something I've never, I've never done. Yeah. He said, now, welcome to mm. business. So what I'm trying to say, uh, the importance of cash flow. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, they, like they always say, cash flow is the blood of the business. Sure, and sure. Uh, so those are most, those are critical issues that you find that yeah. business um, closed down because of mismanagement no, we hear of cash you. flow. we hear you on that. And I think you've, whoa, you've just raised such an important, getting paid as a young person. <laughs> yeah. Why is it so hard to click that button? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you've got to wait, and no, you've got to do this and do that. It's like, People don't want to like actually make the payment. It's like you don't deserve to be paid when you're young. What's going on here, people? <laughs> some lows, some lows. Um, I think I want. I just want to touch on my story. Um, for me, like environment is everything. Nature mm. is nothing. We at Zakane and me and my friends when we were young, grade nine, grade ten, we were like our success plan was so simple, dog. Is move <laughs> out home, go to Jobek. <laughs> Meet DJ Spoo, Done. and you're successful. That's it. That's, That's it. it. <laughs> Why didn't I think Why? of that? You know what I mean? <laughs> and I met DJ Spoo, and nothing changed, you know? Um, I remember in 2014, I had um, just left a brand that my couple of friends of ours started, and we did so well, man. We were doing so well. I was 22. I'm a dropout from varsity, and we went to Nana Nixi, and we got an investment for 250000 with just an idea. Hmm. And we did so well within the first six months of the business, and we had a fall off. You know, because money started coming in, a bit of fame started playing, newspaper and all of that. People started showing their real colors. Mm. I left that brand, moved back home. And my grand was like, I told you this thing is not going to work. Find a job, you know. And for me, I was like, they don't get me. They don't get me. I'm a creative. I'm a creative. And I remember every day, I would ask for money to go and see Joburg. For me, seeing Joburg was just enough. Seeing people walking around Joburg, you don't know what they're up to. You know, everybody's just busy. And me, that kind of inspired me. I want to be part of this movement. I want to be part of this change. Um, I moved into my friend's house, into my friend's house, whatever. Long story short, um, use of social media. I started to put the gene maker on Instagram and Twitter. I started tweeting, something big is coming, something big is coming. I'm not next. <laughs> something huge is coming. Yeah. Watch out, watch out, watch out. And a friend of mine saw that I had such, like I really, really love this thing. She's my ex-girlfriend. She gave me a loan for 8,000 rands. And don't ask me if I paid the back or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's on, now it's on record. Now so, yeah, um, yeah. And she gave me a loan for 8,000 rand. And she's like, listen, I believe in you so much because you believe in yourself so badly. Mabana um, Nyugo, go start what you want to start. Took that money, um, inv invested in 100 pair of jeans. Took me six months to sell those jeans. I was living hand to mouth. Fast forward 2014, um, 2000, what, last year? 2018. The business has been growing, you know. Um, I think business is about people. The more people you touch, the more you stay in business. And it's like I was saying, Guti, the best-selling book is when you've touched one person. And for me, it was always touching mm. one person, having a relationship with people. And I remember last year, before I opened my atelier at Victoria Yards, I was in Cape Town. Um, and I saw this place in Victoria Yards, and I moved in. I was like, listen, I'm taking this place. Prepare it for me. I'll pay you. Send me the invoice, blah, blah, blah. Big mouth, no money, nothing but brand. Um, go to Cape Town, mini five-star hotel, sitting on minus 64 rand in my account. 
the landlords are calling me, Tseps, your space is ready. You know, you need to move in. Your space is ready. Sending me pictures. I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to pay this? And I've realized that um, I've touched so many people with my journey that I started making calls to all my clients. Guys, this is what's happening. I'm opening an atelier. I need business. One client of mine was like, listen, I love you so much, dude. 950000 Go start what you want to start. Paid rent. A friend of mine was like, listen, Tabs, my uncle has machines that has been sitting there since 96. Come get <laughs> machines. Went to Limpopo, got machines. Trump. And that's how I started my business. That's how I started to mm -hmm. see the growth of my business. My lows were like, I mismanaged my cash. You know, there was a point I had so much money in my bank account. I was like, listen, in one telling you 8,000 rand in his account to so much zeros in his account, I mismanaged it. My friend and I used to fly to Cape Town, pop some bottles, come back, kumnandi. But like, I've learned so much with my yeah. journey that now I make such um, informed decisions. And the thing and is... can I ask you to, to round off so we can just yeah, get some, some cool. other views? And the thing is, like for me, like Lento was saying, is that you just need to start. Whatever it is, just needs to start. 98%, like 2% is idea, 98% cool. is execution. Cool. Just start. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So just some other views of the lows because we're coming towards the end of our hour. Can yeah. you believe it? So just uh, some brief you know, stories of, of the hardships and then we'll round off. Um, I think um, we'll, we'll, we'll one of the mind. lows, especially, you know, as a first generation entrepreneur, will always be starting. Um, you're hmm. leaving a corporate with like all that security and you want to start this thing and you're not even sure how it's going to work and you're trying to explain to your parents that this is what I want to do, but you're not quite sure, you don't quite know how it's going to work. So the biggest um, challenge is starting. And then, of course, because you are a first-generation entrepreneur, there is no mentorship. You just grow up in a business watching how it works. There is no blueprint. You are literally putting this thing together on your own. Um, so then that becomes difficult. And then I want to tie that in with her question about, um, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, access, you know, things like funding? And how, how I did that in my business was, to access accelerators and incubators. There are entire organizations in South Africa that exist solely to help you as an entrepreneur. And the information about these is very freely available on the internet, on Facebook, on Twitter. All you need to do is Google. And I think that's my challenge to the youth. There is information out there. Go out and find it. Yes. Okay, absolutely. Mokhadi, you wanted to intervene on these hardships and then what I'm going to do is take one last round and I'll start on this side with Lebo Khan, and we'll end off as is customary with a final view but just in one or two sentences your final sense of what today means for you and why it's important to you but we'll start with Mohadi and yeah. then I'll go all the way around so we can round off yeah I, am, I won't be long because she, uh, uh, Mohal, covered a lot Capture. of what I wanted to say. But I wanted to say, um, people want shortcuts. You know, they say, oh my God, I'm sitting here, I have no money, um, I, I, I don't have capital to start. But they don't do any research. You know, they don't even go into Google and find out, you know, if I want to become a beekeeper, what does a beehive look like? You know, are there courses in South Africa that offer beekeeping training? Mm. You know, they don't, um, they are not self-starters but they want everything to be given on a, uh, on a silver platter. And this doesn't apply to everybody. But I've, I've experienced that a lot of people who inquire about what I do and want to actually do that too, come to me and they say, I want to be a beekeeper, give me information. Where am I going to start? You know, how about trying to find the information, doing your part, so that by the time you come to sure. me, you say, look, I've realized that it costs this much. Where did you get funding to, to start? I already have boots. I already have gloves. You know, and, and, and that makes it easy for anybody to even, okay. you know, take you seriously and actually have a proper conversation with you and sit down with you and, you know, give you any uh, advice that they may have. So be self-starters, find information. It's, it's, it's the new age. If, if you can be on Instagram, you can definitely Google, you know, whatever it is, ideas, <laughs> or that you want to actually execute as a business. For sure. <laughs> well, uh, and wow, we're getting quite, uh, quite an audience around <laughs> us. Hello to everyone. Thank you for being a part of this. I'm going to, as I said, just in one or two sentences, if you can keep it really brief and yeah. to the point, just your concluding thoughts and concluding messages to our audience 
and this generation? Lebo Khan, we'll start with you. So my thing is, one thing I know about business is I was listening to everyone, purposely kept quiet, because I wanted to hear everyone's story. And what comes about is, it doesn't matter how good you are in whatever that you think you're going to do, failure and hardships are part of the journey, and that is something that we all need to understand. All of us here have a story of failure, we have a story of hardships. Some of them is cash flow, some of us we lost cars and got repossessed and the likes. But it's part of the journey and so I think the major thing is resilience. And being in digital marketing, I love social media, but the other side of social media is the fact that you wake up today, you get introduced to a Lebhang because you saw him on on mainland live does so. Um, and then you get introduced to Lebohang, you Google Lebohang, you go on his profile, and maybe Lebohang is the flashy kind, and you see that like, oh my gosh, this guy has made it. But what you don't know is there are the 12 businesses that he started, and 11 of them failed. And the business that you see today is the 12th business that he reiterated and made it work through the lesson. So I think the major thing is understanding it's a journey, number one. It's full of failure, hardships, and everything. But eventually, you will get there. I think I, I echo what they both saying. Um, no one's coming to save us, guys. We are the ones <laughs> we've been waiting for. Thanks. So no one's coming to spoon feed you, you know. You have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Unfortunately, that's just how it is. You know, none of us had, you know, a rich uncle who gave you capital. You had to go out there and find it. And so, yeah, that's, that's my ending word. If you, are, if you want the help, go out and find it. Well, to the youth of today, um, there is a saying, uh, an African saying, which says it takes a village to raise a child. Um, my, my message is for them to reach out to the society and identify the mentors, identify the coach, because you can't go through this journey alone. You need those who are ahead of you to show you the way. And also, they need to to believe in themselves. I mean, South Africa is a great country with great opportunities. Find a niche. Don't copy what everybody else is doing. Find a niche and there are a lot of people who can support you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, I had this quote yesterday and it says, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> and I don't think none of us wants to be on the menu. You want to be the guy who's eating. So just start. If you have a crazy idea, collaborate and start. If you know how to brand, Go to a person or print, you know what I mean? Work together, collaborate, and that's how you're going to win. Well, speaking as the only person on this panel who is not actually an entrepreneur right now, I will say the following. That is that as young people, we have the capacity, we have the capability to loosen the shackles of mediocrity that have bound so many to complacency. And the reason why I say that is because it is our time, we can and we will. We will not emulate and we will not imitate because as young people, we definitely are not limited by our age. We are not limited by that experience. Once you get your mind right, there is absolutely nothing and nobody that can stand in your way. So to every young person who is listening to this today, you have got to know that you can and you will, and there is nobody that can stand in your way. Amen. I think even your mic is like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for those brilliant awesome. words. Oh, wow. I hope I won't be an anti <laughs> um, You know, there's no better time to be alive. Mm. Um, we are facing the biggest challenges in South Africa, but we are exposed to the best and the biggest opportunities. So I'm going to start with your question, what is the mission? Um, mm. Our mission as the youth is to smash stereotypes. Um, we have to challenge the challenges. They are there. They are not going anywhere. We need to find our way around them, and only you can save yourself from yourself. Like, like, you just have to smash the stereotypes and challenge the challenges. And mom will end with some wisdom from another equally important generation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want to call it wisdom, but I have to tell you, um, I am so inspired. And it, it's amazing that even as the older generation, I have learned quite a bit you know, from you you know, tonight and just understanding that sometimes you just need to start and believe in yourself because even as an older generation, the reason why we've got 
the generational gaps and the communication gaps is that we are maybe not as confident as we should be in ourselves and we actually have a lot to learn from you. So thank you for tonight and thank you for allowing Midland Park to actually have a platform for the youth because our aim is to actually support our youth to thrive and not just survive. So thank you. And I want to say thank you to you and to Midland Park for giving us this platform for not just speaking but for doing. I want to thank Starbucks for hooking us up with the coffee. I think I was the only person who drank, guys. Please. Uh, Mine is uh, finished. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe it's I was finished. just focusing on mine. Um, and finally, one thing to our audience. I thought your interventions were absolutely brilliant. And thank you so much for just stepping up to the plate and really deepening the conversation. And our other audience, you guys were brilliant too. I know you couldn't say anything, but I know you were listening. Shout out to you. Everybody loves you. On SMWX, Menlin Park, on the YouTube page, on the uh, Facebook page, we'd like to thank Estee Lauder, who had us looking rather good today. Um, or maybe, you be the judge. Go easy. And last but not least, to our brilliant panelists for providing a spark of inf inspiration, for providing entertainment at times, and ultimately a new form of education for a new generation. We appreciate you, keep doing what you do, and let's move this mission forward. Thanks for joining us. Well done, that was beautiful. Hey.